welcome to Shipwreck Tales. I hope you're enjoying your warmth at home. These sort of stories certainly uh, make it more enjoyable and make you appreciate it. John McChrystal with another Shipwreck Tale. And last week we did uh, one from the Auckland Islands, which has been a real graveyard for ships in the past. The Auckland Islands are about uh, 200 miles south of Stewart Island. This week, it's a bizarre juxtaposition between the Grafton Wreck and the Wreck of the Invercold, which is our subject today. John, just give us a background, a bit of background on the Invercold. Yeah, the Invercold was a British ship. Uh, she was 888 tonnes, so pretty substantial. She was sailing from Melbourne uh, and bound for Kalau in Peru, uh, and she was sailing in ballast, so she had no cargo to speak of aboard. Uh, there were no passengers and only 25 crew. So, yeah, lightly laden and not particularly heavily populated, which proved to be fortunate. Okay, and what year was this? I'm sorry, this was 1864. She sailed on May the 3rd from Melbourne. So she's a couple of months after the Grafton got into trouble uh, way down there at the south end of Auckland Island. As you described last week, but if people missed it, to recap, the Auckland Islands were incorrectly mapped, so they did snare a lot of ships. Yeah, and the way the Invercald was snared could be regarded as pretty typical of the way it happened. Uh, she was sailing along and favourable breeze, but pretty foggy, and that is the major danger in that part of the world. What is happening is all that cold water that's sort of washing up from the Antarctic area is hitting comparatively warmer air and creating a lot of fog. Now, in those days, in the 19th century, the only way you had of fixing position accurately was uh, using an octant or a sextant or something like that and sighting some celestial body. Now, if it's overcast for four or five days, then the sort of fuzziness around your position gets pretty great. The captain, William Delgano, of the, um, the Invercald knew that he was getting into the proximity of the Auckland Islands. As you say, they were out of position on his chart, most probably. But he knew there was danger around, so he did what any prudent seaman would do in that situation and ordered a double watch. But, yeah, what, a, what an awful feeling that must be for a sea captain, knowing that danger is out there somewhere, but not quite knowing exactly where it is. And having very, very limited visibility. It can be almost zero sometimes. That's right. He would have had two or three nautical miles, and on the day in question, May the 10th, so a week after leaving, 7.40 in the evening, so it's pretty dark, something looms out of the mist and uh, it's immediately identified as land. It's on their port bow, uh, so they have to do a, a, a sudden calculation as to what they're looking at and where they've got to go to get uh, clear of the rest of it. Their suspicion was that what they were looking at was Southwest Cape, the southwestern extremity of Auckland Island. They were tragically wrong. It seems that what they were looking at was Northwest Cape, the northwestern extremity of Auckland Island. The evasive action they took was premised on the fact that most of the land was to the northeast of them. So they turned south and uh, sailed before a pretty strong breeze uh, into what they hoped was the open Southern Ocean. But, uh, it, but it wasn't. You had all no. the Auckland Islands, and, and that, I understand that west coast of the Auckland Islands is it kind of a bit fjordland like -y. She comes straight out of the sea, straight up. It does. And in fact, Fiordland's pretty impressive, but the Auckland's are like pretty much nothing on earth, I think. They, the, the cliffs can get up to a thousand feet high. They're absolutely vertical. The bit of the coast that the Invercald was looking at was comparatively hospitable in that the cliffs were only about six or 700 feet high and there was the odd beach at the foot of them that distinguishes that part of the coast from the more southerly coast, which is just, it's a, it's a rampart. When they, do they get into trouble because of strong winds? Yeah, well, what's happening is you've got a, a square-rigged vessel which can sail very well before a breeze, but as soon as they're required to go into the breeze, make any headway against the direction the wind is coming from, they can't do it. And needless to say, what they've done here sailing before a nor'wester is they've turned and run before it, and then at the moment when the land loomed out of the mist again on their starboard bow this time, indicating that they're, they're in trouble to the north and they're in trouble to the south, and of course, straight ahead of them, they've got no options. They're, they're, um, they're at the mercy of whatever is in front of them. For 
landlubbers, is that like that moment when you've hit the brakes but you know it's too late and, oh, I know I'm going to crash? That is the perfect analogy. You can think of the Invercald at, at the moment, they sighted landfall again as locked up and skidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell us of the wreck and how they got ashore and, and, and what happened. Yeah, the, the time between when they sighted land again and when they were smashed to bits uh, was very short. Uh, they took what evasive action they could. They, they tacked and tried to run uh, out of trouble, but yeah, just kept raising more land ahead of them. And eventually, the inevitable happened. Uh, they were washed too close to the cliffs and they struck. It was pretty dark. It was very windy, massive seas smashing onto the cliffs. Is it night time now? It is night time okay. now, it's full night. The, the ship ripped her bottom out on a reef and uh, sank very quickly. There were 25 crew and uh, 19 managed to get washed, washed ashore on a little beach in a little nook on these massive cliffs. But because the time was so short between when they realised they were in trouble and when uh, their worst fears were realised, there was none of the planning available to them that maybe the Grafton boys had and yeah. perhaps other, other ship trek sailors get. So a prime example is the cook who, when the captain gave the order that everyone should dress as warmly as they could, he went down below and only had time to throw on his best suit, which was fine wool, double-breasted outfit, and it shrank in the surf. So by the time he got ashore, he could barely move. Because a lot of these wrecks do happen at night because it's the lack of visibility that happens, that just simply compounds the terror uh, because it's not like <laughs> you've got a wreck and a little pontoon that you can walk to the beach. You've got to go through, it, 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 try it when you've got a ship. I mean, it's ridiculous trying to get ashore. Yeah, it's um, a situation here where the ship was suddenly gone from underneath them really, and they were in the surf. Yeah, not all seamen in those days could actually swim. Mm. Uh, in fact, it was quite popular among sea captains to hire people on the basis they couldn't swim because they were less likely to jump ship in port. So, <laughs> You are shoved in the in the wildest surf that the planet has to offer, and uh, yeah, by some miracle, only six were drowned in that initial incident. Okay, their first night ashore. First night ashore, they discovered that most of them were barefoot because they kicked off their sea boots. Any bulky clothing in the surf they struggled clear of, if they were lucky enough to survive. So they were underdressed. It's bloody cold, remember? This is the subantarctics and... Uh, it's getting on for, for winter, so yeah, very cold. And they really are they're, they're stuck at the foot of a cliff with, I mean, you said a, a beach, but it's not really a beach. We're not thinking of Ongata. It's, no, it's just a few rocks and then a cliff above them. Yeah, we're thinking of a ramp of shingle, basically, and it's being pounded by the surf and they're huddled at the head of it. They managed to get some sailcloth to, to huddle underneath and they discover that washed up alongside them there's been some biscuit and some salt pork but not nearly enough to keep them going and not for any length of time they do the old search the pockets thing which is de rigueur for for castaways and they discover to their delight two boxes of matches they get a fire going pretty easily but then one of the boxes of matches is placed next to the fire to dry out and it catches fire so they're down to one box of matches now, one thing that has to be said about all of these castaway stories is that they're brought to us by the survivors. And so events are filtered through those pretty unreliable narrators. And most of the the narrative that, that we've received from the Invercald came from a fellow called Bob Holding, Robert Holding, who was a young member of the crew. He was newly signed on and didn't know the others, and that became significant later on. And while William Delgano, the captain, and one of the mates survived, the first mate survived also, their accounts are patchy and there are some conflicts there. And so what you can immediately deduce is that people are telling a story that places them in, in the best possible light. But if he's to believe, Holding was the man who sort of came to the fore at this point. He grabbed the box of matches that hadn't been burned up shoved them in his own pocket and refused to allow them to be placed by the fire to try uh, like the other ones. Yes, you learnt that lesson. At this time, unbeknownst to them, of course, were the castaways of the Grafton on the same island. That's right, 30 miles to the south, a little bit more than 30 miles. It's quite a way really, isn't it? It's not surprising. It is. 
And as the albatross flies, that's how far it is. But given that other people traversing this, and in fact, when they made for the east coast, a distance of about two miles as, as the bird flies, these guys took days to reach the other coast. It is not easy going, and it's extremely dangerous country to traverse, especially in a north-south direction. It's difficult and dangerous and not recommended if you're fully fit with modern gear. Yeah, and not shocked, rigid by what's just happened to you and yeah. half-starved. Yeah. yeah. And things get pretty ugly and pretty grim very quickly with the Invercold, I understand. Um, they do. They we'll, do. we'll take a break. Don't go anywhere, people. Shipwreck Tales, this, another Auckland Island tragedy from 1864, The Wreck of the Invercold, with John McChrystal. Follow. Shipwreck Tales with John McChrystal. This week, The Wreck of the Invercold, 1864 on the Auckland Islands, perilous west coast, the ship sunk and of 25 19 have made it ashore one box of matches is gone and they haven't even been on shore i think for uh, 24 hours yet it's the night of the wreck they're shocked and they're freezing at the base of a huge cliff john pick it up from there things get grim quite quickly they do for lack of any sort of plan they um huddle on that beach for five days and five nights and meanwhile, one of the spars of the Invercald is projecting from the wreck out of the water, and there's the corpse of one of their shipmates sort of entangled in the rigging. And apparently it came as quite a relief to these guys when finally it got washed off, because, yeah, they had a slightly better view from that point. Yeah. But eventually they realised that they were going to starve on this beach if they didn't do something to save themselves. So four of them climbed the cliffs. There was a waterfall running down into their position. They had fresh water, and that also obviously gave them a slightly more stable route up off the beach, up the cliffs. How, how long uh, did they uh, wait until they tried to climb this awful cliff? Yeah, it was five days, five, five days. nights. Oh, so yeah. basically they exhausted their food. Mm. Yeah, four of them climbed and eventually they found their way back and this, by this time there were only three of them. The fourth arrived a little bit later, a man named Tate. He had fallen from the cliffs halfway up onto the rocks and they didn't hold out much hope for him at the time. He actually struggled back, but he was in a pretty bad way. And when it was reported that there was actually a way up and that the, the rest of the company could follow them, Tate was obviously too badly injured to make it. So they left him there with one man who volunteered to take care of him while he died. The rest climbed to the top of the cliff and to their delight, uh, the first thing they saw was a small pig, which didn't last much longer than that. They lit a fire and they ate it. And as you would, the fellow who was nursing his dying comrade down on the beach, smelling roasting pork, got up that cliff pretty damn quickly. And that was the last anyone saw of uh, poor old Tate, alive at least. Right, yeah. Because um, he, well, he basically pretty much fell to his death. Yeah, he, 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 yeah. He, was, he sustained injuries that weren't survivable from falling uh, on the initial exploratory attempt to get to the top of the cliff. Okay, so they're not at the base of a cliff with the sea in front of them, uh, just on a, a ramp of shingle. They're on top, but it's not Club Med. No. What they're now faced with is the typical subantarctic tussock land, which is boggy. The tussock is not tussock like we're used to it down in central Otago and what have you. Uh, it grows as tall as a person does, so that the tufty bit is actually sort of at head level, and in between it there's deep, boggy, peaty channels. These are made boggier and peatier and worse by the pigs that were released onto Auckland Island by their discoverers, ironically, as it seems, as a um, food source for castaways. These have sort of overrun Auckland Island and they've carved these great big deep channels through the tussock, and so you've got to hop from tussock to tussock, it's razor sharp, or you've got to make your way through these awful, awful reeking channels between them. Uh, once you've got through that, you come across the Rata Forest, which, as we've described, is incredibly tortuous. It's very low growing. Fighting your way through that can be just about impossible. And in fact, in many cases, castaways on the Aucklands have found it easier to try going over the canopy, actually on top of the trees, uh -huh. rather than trying to slog their way through it. Three of them and the cook, who as we know is wearing his best suit and can hardly move, uh, he got to the top of the cliff. They go off exploring. And meanwhile, Bob Holding, who's emerging as a bit of a leader of this, of, uh, this group of survivors, has now decided that their best chance is to try to get to the east coast. 
the three returned without the cook, who apparently so badly pinched and chafed and just generally dehydrated, starved and miserable, has lain down and decided that he's not going any further. So one of them has dropped. And this ends up being the pattern for the next little while, actually. This group of survivors, not being held together by any kind of plan or leadership, keeps splintering into smaller groups, and those smaller groups become less effective at surviving. It, it's, amazing, don't. it's amazing how, in this story and others as well, it's a bit of a re repeating theme. This, when there's no leadership, or, or sometimes even when there is, there are some people that just get this sudden ennui uh, or inertia. They just can't move. They just sit down and give up. Yeah, it, it's an understandable impulse. If the problem is too great, if you don't have the mental resources yourself to just grapple with the problem, then you, you're really at, at the mercy of, of the elements unless someone can impose the necessary discipline and fortitude and morale upon you. Mm -hmm. It becomes extremely important. So note to self, really, if shipwrecked, either become a leader or look for one. <laughs> The natural leader, of course, or the official leader, I shouldn't say natural leader, the official leader is William Delgano. He seems to have done nothing about trying to hold all these guys together. And in fact, as we'll see, he became more of a problem than a solution as time went on. Yeah. Okay. This group doesn't seem to be have any cohesion, and they do start dropping like flies. But how long does it take? Well, it takes a few days. Uh, the, the next move they make is four of them, including uh, four of them plus holding, decide they'll go back to the site of the wreck and just see if they can get anything that might be useful to them, particularly food, because they're having no luck at the moment actually catching anything to eat and they're slowly starving. So the, four, the five of them arrive, they climb back down the cliff and they're back on the beach. They find Tate lying dead there. They also find a large chunk of unidentifiable but very rotten meat which has come from the shipwreck, and so they eat it. Whether they're eating one of their shipmates or whether they're eating a piece of salt pork, they can't tell. Mm. Poor old Holding, describing this episode, says it was too rotten to put on a stick to roast, it didn't smell too good while it was cooking, didn't taste too good, and the rest can be imagined. He spots the ship's pig, uh, or the corpse of it, wedged in the rocks, so he goes over to try to salvage that, and he gives it a good heave, and the, the hindquarters just can become completely detached because it's so rotten. But what do you do? You eat that too. <laughs> Apart from that, they found nothing of value. So it was pretty clear that their only uh, avenue for survival now is to make it to the East Coast and hope that it's more hospitable over there. They've got very little knowledge of the geography of the Auckland Islands. They've got very little idea of what kind of food resources might be there to sustain them. Do they all decide to give that a go or are some just sitting down? Like the cook. Pretty much they're sitting down like the cook. Huddled there, the four whom Holding was was on the beach with have decided that since things are looking so bleak, they'd better draw lots to work out who's going to get eaten. Holding is a young man at sea and he's heard all the stories and he knows that the first to go is basically the cabin boy and he's the closest thing they've got on the beach. So he scarpers and let, lets the four of them decide what they're going to do for themselves. Those four are never seen again. Um, Holding decides that he is going to personally find his way to the East Coast because it's an attractive alternative when the alternative is being eaten and uh, he sets off to do it. It takes him days but he makes it and what he finds there are large limpets clinging to the rocks and the odd mussel. He's got the matches, he cooks himself a decent feed of those and he goes back and persuades the others to move on. What does he see when he comes back to see them and tell them limpets ahoy? He finds a disconsolate bunch sitting around pretty dull-eyed in the advanced stages of salvation. They spark up a bit when he appears reeking of his recent meal of limpets and uh, decide that what they're going to do is join him. So they start... Uh, have, 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 when they were, when they were, he comes back and sees them, had they made a, a shelter, a bivouac or anything? Is there anything to make a shelter of? Or were they just sitting out there in the rain and the hail day and night? Yep, they're, they're sitting in the Rata Forest, on the, skirt, the outskirts of the Rata Forest, but as you say, exposed to the elements. And exposure is a real risk here. You've got this biting westerly coming through, and there is snow, hail and sleet by turns, brightening your day. Well, I suppose it's not a remarkable thing at all to wonder about inertia and why people just give up. It's more remarkable to contemplate the attitude of Mr Holding, who actually... Yep 
in these conditions gave it a lash. Absolutely. Um, he himself credits his own survival to the fact that he hadn't made the trip out from Britain aboard the ship. And in fact, he'd been living the high life in Melbourne and had bodily resources that weren't available to the others. Uh -huh. He's a bit of a porker, I, get, I gather. Right. And he was, yeah, burning those resources furiously while the others were coming up empty. Okay. Uh, yep. So they decide to follow him. But just for an update, what's the body count now? Right. Well, we've still got, what have we lost? We've lost six so far, so we're down to about 13. Yep. Holden takes five with him to the east coast and then once they get there he sends a man back they're expecting six more to join them but instead only four come no one knows quite what happened to the other two cannibal is that the shadow of cannibalism is hanging over the group by now yeah yeah because as you said with the other four that went missing and no one ever heard anything of them again uh it does pique the imagination doesn't it just to wonder it's those stories that never get told it sure does. Yeah, th they're not going to go go back to civilization and brag about what they did to stay alive if it looks morally shameful. There had been a case, and we might in fact discuss this later in the series, where a bunch of people had been set adrift in an open boat through the loss of their vessel, and eventually they resorted to cannibalism, and it was known in those days in the Royal Navy as the custom of the sea. Right. When it came to it, you could chow down on your shipmates, basically, but this court case showed that you had to be in much more desperate straits than these people were before you take that awful final step and they were in fact convicted of a heinous crime so yeah the custom of the sea had somewhat changed by the time the Invercal people were there and so you're not going to go pleading necessity the four come over the ridge and they say well what happened to barry and alan they say well <laughs> that's right oh yeah they're back there somewhere yeah they weren't okay. looking too good when we left them uh but crook Right. Yeah, okay. so here they are, they're now on the, the east coast, they quickly strip the limpets uh, from the rocks, limpets don't get about too much so you take them off the rocks and there's nothing left. So they began to work their way north, a around three weeks has elapsed since the ship was wrecked and they're down to ten men, I think my maths has gone slightly faulty somewhere along the line but you get the picture, yep. they've been, they've been falling by the wayside. Yep. Yeah. Now they think they're saved when one day they come over the hill and what they see is a village. You'd feel pretty pretty happy at that point, but as they get closer they discover that the village is pretty much derelict. And what they're looking at here is the remains of a settlement, a short-lived settlement that was established in Port Ross on the northeastern coast of Auckland Island in 1846 to service the whaling fleet. Turned into an alcoholic shambles pretty quickly and was sort of called off as a as a bad idea in 1849 mm. and everyone was taken off the island very shortly thereafter there was a bunch of maori actually who independently tried settling auckland island around the same time they left shortly after the europeans did and so there were no permanent residents on auckland island after 1849 so was there a shelter there were broken down huts and they discovered one that was relatively intact and probably most importantly had an intact chimney uh, so they set up residence in there. They managed to kill a seal around the same time and that prevented starvation for all of them. And they also found bits and pieces of tools and the odd scrap of metal that could be used as containers, notably for boiling seawater for salt, which is very important at the same time. But by now they're all exhausted and they're, um, they're half starved, maybe even three quarters starved. They're very cold, they're in very poor physical condition and their wild food resources are just about gone. It's the worst time to be trying to live off sea lions because they're, they're out at sea feeding up themselves. We'll take a break and come back with more and how this pans out. The Wreck of the Invercolds, Shipwreck Tales with John McChrystal. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Shipwreck Tales with John McChrystal. Three weeks on the godforsaken Auckland Islands. Miserable, sideways rain, sleet, day, night. But this shabby group made it to the other side of the island, found some sort of shelter, but the attrition rate's been pretty high. Uh, I think it was about 10 people left of the 25 that were on the boat and some may have been cannibalised, but we don't have the confirmation of the story. John? Take it from there, they've been there a month. They've been there a month, a miserable month. Holding realises, of course, their wild food is gone, they're going to have to explore further. 
he's the only one keen for the job, so off he goes. When he gets back, he discovers that three more have turned up their toes and that two more are missing because th they decided, like him, that they needed to go exploring. He does actually find them, so we're, we're down to seven people now. And now the biggest problem that faces them for the remainder of their time here, apart from starvation, despair, the climate, that kind of stuff, the, um, the biggest problem rears its ugly head, and that is the division in their ranks. What you've got is a bunch of officers, Delgano and the two mates, and you've got a bunch of ordinary seamen there. And one group believes the other group should do all the fetching and carrying for them. The second mate in particular, this fellow Maloney, once they've established they can set up this hut in reasonable comfort, get a fire going, uh, he installs himself on the only bunk available and uh, starts ordering the two youngest members of the party to fetch and carry for him. So he sends them to get water for him, he sends them to get food for him. They use up their valuable physical resources fetching and carrying for him, and they pretty quickly die too. Good, we've got about 15 dead and all, and in a parlous state, they'd be looking like concentration camp victims, and they are bickering about who does what. Absolutely. They're trying to maintain, well, the officers are trying to maintain a shipboard hierarchy, but it's it's sort of all, all yeah, all the privilege and none of the reciprocal duties. They're not... Yeah. doing anything to establish a plan to keep them alive here. All they're doing is uh, making sure that the others do the hard work. Holding's not having any of this, so he goes off again and takes the two other explorers with him. While they're away, one of the, their number dies, and uh, Holding is pretty horrified to discover that his other companion is munching on the dead guy. And this is the only official report of cannibalism that we, that we have. Uh. Uh, and the practitioner of it died. Yeah, so Holding yet again goes back to the site of the former village of Hardwick and tries to persuade Delgano to join him, Delgano being the captain. The captain eventually agrees, but they discover that Maloney, the second mate, despite all the fetching and carrying that others have done, is too weak to to join the party. And so he'd, been ordering, he'd been ordering people about, go, he even ordered them, go get me some water. That's right, that's right. Uh, quite ridiculous and it sort of sealed his fate for him as well because eventually once they'd established themselves at a slightly better location that Holding had scoped out, Holding himself went back to try to bring Maloney along. Maloney pulled a knife on him and ordered him to fetch him some water. Holding needless, needless to say refused and that was the last time that Maloney was seen alive. Right. So here we are. We're even further north than Hardwick. We're right up on the northeastern tip of Auckland Island. It's a relatively sheltered, relatively hospitable part of Auckland Island. There's a stony beach around there. There's comparatively tall rata forest providing a little bit of shelter. There's access to tussock to make thatched huts, which is what they, they end up doing. Trouble is, what we've now got, we've got Delgano the captain, we've got the first mate, and we've got Holding, an ordinary seaman and a junior one at that. Delgano orders that Holding should build his thatched hut 60 metres away from the officer's encampment. So mm -hmm. you've got two separate en encampments among three people, which is utterly ridiculous. Oh, dear, oh dear, oh dear. And just a reminder, <laughs> this bizarre juxtaposition in time and place that at this, for the duration of this uh, hellish time of the Invercold, the wreck of the Grafton on the same island um, further south. Further south, the Grafton boys are being DIY gods, they're making yeah. soap, they're making cement, they're just, yeah, they're, they're making it work for them. Making cement to make a, a hearth and a chim... Oh, heavens, yeah. Well, it is a bit of a different uh, situation, but it seems as though this man holding is the one ray of hope for them, perhaps. Holding is holding them together. Mm. And what he engineers next is having persuaded the others that there are better prospects of finding seals on the outer islands. There are a few little islets scattered around outside Port Ross. Holding has spotted seals from a distance on those. So he builds himself a coracle of all things, which is a skin boat, uh, a seal skin boat. He uses tortuous sort of rata branches to, to make the framing. It's an incredibly unseaworthy vessel, but he gets across to one of these islands called Rose Island these days. He calls it Rabbit Island because it's overrun with rabbits. Oh, that's handy. That is handy. Uh, it's also, as he promised, reasonably abundant in seals. 
So he goes back and manages to persuade for the first time Delgano and his mate to join him in an attempt to save themselves. They build a they build a bit of a punt out of the remains of some of the huts down in Hardwick. They use this to sort of successfully get up the coast. Holden foolishly leaves it in charge of the sea captain, who doesn't tie it up high enough. Oh. And when a bit of a wind comes along, off she floats. So they build another one, and in fact Holden grudgingly admits that the second boat they build is actually better than the first one because they learned on the job. Gosh, it's annoying enough when Rose Island. it's annoying enough when someone else steals the remote. But to be in that sort of situation, you've got this stupid captain. He can't even take care of a boat that's been built. Yeah, it would um, make your blood boil, really, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think but, of cannibalism. Yeah, I think I would too. Um, yeah. Except you'd probably expect that anyone with such low moral fibre is going to be yeah. pretty bad in the eating as well. But Perhaps Maybe so. there's no correlation. Hopefully we'll never have to find out. Yes, hopefully. Yeah. So they get out to, uh, to Rose Island using this makeshift boat. They're living out there on seals and the odd scrawny rabbit. They actually build some quite ingenious corral kind of arrangements in order to trap the rabbits. Uh, which are pretty wily. And while they're sort of sitting there gnawing on rabbit bones and what have you, one day Delgano sort of staggers over the hill and says he's seen a ship. Holding's pretty septic at him for not doing anything to signal this ship, but uh, Delgano correctly indicates to him that he expects the ship to round the point, and sure enough she does. They light the largest fire they can, they jump jump up and down as, as high as their, their emaciated bodies will enable them to do, and they do, in fact, attract the attention of wow. a ship named the Julian, who is sailing past on May 22, 1865, a little over a year since the Invercald piled up on the other coast. Four, far out. <coughs> and what? The, how many made it through in the end? So we had 25 in the original muster, 19 got ashore on the other coast, three survived to be taken to Peru to tell their tale. Uh, it's, it would be a remarkable story in its own right, but just the shambles that it became through sheer lack of leadership and uh, lack of a clue, really, on the part of those who were put in a position of responsibility over their crew, namely the captain and the other officers, they just turned it into a total debacle and lives were needlessly lost. How many... Uh, of the three, just the three emaciated men who survived, wrote their story down. Yeah, well, Holdings is the most complete account. Uh, needless to say, he, he does cast himself very much as the leader in the one they got through. Yeah. And the fact that that's likely to be the case is, yeah, the, the corroboration comes in the silence in the accounts of the others who uh. both wrote brief newspaper accounts. They mention the building of a boat, for example, and the, the decision to make the East Coast in the first place, but they don't take credit for that themselves, though they fairly tactfully refrain from giving credit where it's due to the lowly, uh, able seaman, Robert Holding. Mm, okay. And today, I, th I think there are some artefacts from the Invercold castaways that, that still survive today. To my knowledge, there are photographs uh, when when they were, well, not when they were rescued, but w when their story became known, an intensive effort was made to search for potential other survivors on the Auckland Islands. Yeah. The Victorian government sent a steamer down to stock castaway depots and uh, have a good hunt about. Um, and they they photographed fairly extensively the encampment of that the Invercald boys made, three thatched huts set 60 metres apart. I wonder, um, I always wonder, when there are photographs of such things, those that had been through it, what it would feel like to see a photograph of that again. There would be an enormous pride in the achievement of getting through, I think, providing, yeah. of course, you could take credit for the fact you had survived, that you were, a, you were an active participant in your own survival. What would Delgano think? What would he think when he looked in the mirror, when he looked at the photographs? He lost his ship, and then he needlessly, I think, lost most of his men through his own inability to take charge. Artifacts, I'm not so sure. The um, the Invercald was a complete loss, yeah. and no one's ever found the wreck. No one's gone looking because she had no cargo of any value. Oh, who'd want to? Yeah, who would want to? <laughs> I want to. There are artifacts, of course, in as much as the bodies on the island. That's right. And uh, 
we'll talk about the general grant in a subsequent episode, but uh, one of the expeditions that went back to try to salvage the general grant's gold, when they were blundering around on Auckland Island, they discovered a collection of five skeletons, which could be one of the groups from the Invercald, is likely to be one of the groups from the Invercald who had just died of starvation. Of course, we don't know the dynamics within those groups that split off from the main group, mm. but we can be pretty sure that no one emerged to take uh, charge and to impose any kind of effective leadership on, on their mates. We do know how that lot ended. We do. Yeah, and there are gravestones there, at least markers. I think there's one for Maloney, isn't there? That's right. I've had the privilege of standing there and looking at that. Did you? It's a very moving grave, actually. Uh, I find most graves moving, but when you've got the story feeding into the spot where you're standing to look at it, yes. It was actually the survivors from the Grafton who found his body and interred it originally when they made their own selfless search for other castaways after they'd been rescued and before they got back to civilization, They found the hut in which Maloney's body was still lying where he had died of starvation and they buried him. He was reburied in, in his present site and uh, a gravestone erected over him. But yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful little cemetery but a very sad one. Plenty of skeletons on that island, and I suspect uh, some to be discovered as well. Yeah, it would be... I don't know quite how you would set about searching that kind of terrain for human remains. We could assume, I think. Um, uh, so we've got Holding and the, and the Delgano and, the, and one other. They survived. They're on the ship. They're not helicoptered to Stewart Island or anything to a hotel. They're on this boat, and they've... Uh, are off to Peru it's and they're not in great condition it would be a battle for survival having been through what they have uh, it would be tough to survive anyway from there on in they're on the back foot yeah they they were treated very kindly they're all very complimentary to the Chilean crew of the Julian uh, none of whom well most of whom didn't speak any English at all and none of whom spoke very good English so their isolation in many ways continued but at least they were being looked after and fed and for poor old Robert Holding at least he was no longer responsible for the two dud officers but it has to be noted that even aboard ship Delgano and the first mate uh, insisted on being quartered with the officers and poor old <laughs> Bob Holding was stuck in the glory hole the, fo the forecastle with the rest of the, the Chilean crew. John McChrystal, an incredible story. And listeners, another one next week, Shipwreck Tales. Thank you very, very much. In a musty hull in Detroit, they prayed in the Maritime Sailors Cathedral. The church bell chimed.